Well, hello, Crossing students. It's Meg, obviously. Uh, so just an update. Uh, I tested positive for COVID, so I'm just, you know, having a blast staying in my room. Um, yeah, I've been pretty okay. Uh, no symptoms that have been too bad. Um, I'm enjoying some uh, Uber Eats Starbucks holiday cups, so you know. It could be worse, uh, but yeah, I'm okay. Um, I'm hoping to, I mean, I still have like another week in quarantine, so um, I'm feeling fine. I'm over like the worst part of it, um, but yeah, that's why I'm not there. Wah, wah. <sighs> but anyways, um, we are starting a new sermon series um, called Christmas Lights, and we are going to be talking all about um the Christmas season and the way that we kind of build these expectations around Christmas and what we want it to look like. So here's the thing, like I spend most of my life trying to manage my expectations, like keep them low. And then, you know, if life sucks, it's okay, right? I had low expectations to begin with. Or uh, if I have low expectations, and then they get exceeded, it's like, great. You know, I'm not disappointed if I have low expectations. Not trying to be super depressing, but it's kind of nice to live by the saying, the happiest and healthiest people are those whose expectations meet reality. Again, not trying to be depressing. But that just basically means if you keep your expectations low, you are more likely to have them met. And when that happens, you're more likely to be happy, or at least not living disappointed all the time. But here's the thing. There's only one area of my life where I really struggle to keep low expectations, and that is Christmas. I want to have low expectations for Christmas, but there is something about this season where I just cannot do it. <laughs> Every year at Christmas time, I just want it to be the best Christmas ever. And my expectations about what I want to have and what I want to feel around Christmas are always kind of like a movie, right? They're your typical Hallmark movie where there's snow on the ground and everybody's in like sweaters and you're having fantastic holiday parties with all of the most beautiful food from a small town bakery. Like I want that even though I don't remember the last time we had a white Christmas here and uh, there's a pandemic, so that's not happening this year. No holiday parties. Uh, and also, my sweater uh, situation is very impressive, but that doesn't necessarily mean everybody else's is, okay? But I just can't, I can't manage my expectations around Christmas time. And it's not that I, like, expect nothing. It's that I just don't expect much most of the time and this year it's kind of starting to live up uh, because if you saw the tree that they put up in Times Square it's a little bit disappointing it's like pretty sparse not a lot of limbs it's looking a little rough pretty much sums up this year right not fantastic but I guess it has to do uh, Christmas has this power over me where I just want to have all the feelings and all the food, all the decorations, all the sentimental movies, the friends, the family, all of the stuff that the Christmas season could possibly offer. And I want every Christmas, including the one that we're about to celebrate, to be the best Christmas ever. Like I want it to exceed last year, right? At Christmas, you imagine sitting around the Christmas tree and listening to music and drinking hot chocolate and there's smiles everywhere. Or maybe at any time of the year, other than Christmas, you are totally fine being single. But at Christmas, you daydream about your crush showing up at your doorstep uh, on Christmas Eve with the present so perfect you couldn't have asked for anything else. And then there's mistletoe. You get the picture. <laughs> We've all seen those movies, but there's something about Christmas that just makes us dream big, right? We raise our expectations and we imagine having the best Christmas ever, but our expectations are hardly ever met at Christmas. Something is bound to disappoint us because we expect so much. It's the disappointment alone that hurts so much more, which is why, like I said at the beginning, try to keep expectations and all of life low. Just think about it. 
If you think your team is going to lose the football game and then they lose, it's a much easier loss to take than if you are convinced that you are going to win. If you're waiting for your grades to show up at the end of the semester and you are expecting a low C, think how much better that B is going to be whenever it comes walking in the door. If you think vacation time with your family is just going to be full of frustration and fighting with each other 100% of the time where you just wish that you could be with your friends, but then it turns out that the fighting and the frustration only ends up being 30% of the time. Think about how pleasantly surprised you might be. It's will I say yes if I ask them out? I'm prepared for a no. Will I make the team? Probably not. Just looking forward to be the team manager. Will I live a long life and be incredibly wealthy? Well, guessing climate change is going to end that for all of us at age 30, so see how great it is to not expect much. I'm being sarcastic, obviously. Even if you don't realize it, I bet you do the same thing I do in some areas of life. Maybe you're a total optimist when it comes to your dating life. You're sure that everyone loves you, or you're super confident in your athletic ability, and there's no question you're going to make varsity as a freshman, but when it comes to areas of faith, I bet you, like a lot of us, keep your expectations really low. Here's what I mean. We might pray, but rarely do we think that God will do exactly what we're asking for, right? We would say that we have faith, but the truth is we're just not sure that God is going to show up and act the way we think he should because God never seems to quite do what we expect what he's going to do. That happens over and over. It almost feels like it's just easier to stop expecting so much. And what does it look like to lower our expectations for God? We stop praying, right? We believe that God either can't or won't do anything. We lose interest in anything faith related because God seems distant, far away, and uncaring. We think that God is weak and then assume that he's unable to do anything big or powerful. We think God is uninterested, that he doesn't know or care about anything in our lives, so why bother telling him or expecting him to do anything about it? We don't always do it on purpose, we just kind of become this way sometimes. What if, you know, God does answer our prayers? What if he does show up? What if he does do what we ask him to do, then great. It's a pleasant surprise. But set out with expectations to do all of those things feels like a big mistake. I don't know about you, but that kind of God doesn't sound like something that we should be celebrating at Christmas, right? What if we've got him all wrong? What if we were missing the point and there was a better and a more realistic way, a healthier way to see God that if we really understood, we would actually make this the best Christmas ever. So what's the point? What is a good God really? So the good news is we aren't the first people to have a lack of expectations with God or having high expectations with God and then him not meeting them. In fact, the Christmas story, which is obviously what we're celebrating in the coming weeks, just didn't happen at all like people expected it to. Now that might sound strange to say because the story may be too familiar to us, so to imagine it going any different would be weird, but the truth is there's no way that 2,000 years ago that they were imagining that God would send his son, the Messiah, the way that he did. But before we go any further, let's get a refresher on the details of the Christmas story itself. So there's Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was a young, pregnant Jewish teenager. Yeah, you heard that right. She was a teenager uh, and a young one at that, like not like 18, 19, like closer to like 13. Uh, she was not yet married, okay? She and Joseph, the man that she was engaged to be married to, did not have a lot of money and they were living in a land that was occupied by the Roman Empire. And at the start of the story, the Roman government had decided that they wanted a census. So they wanted a count of all of the people that they were ruling. So every family was told to go to the town that they were originally from to be counted. So Mary, who is pregnant, has to get on a donkey and make a hot and miserable trip to get to the town where Joseph's family came from. Okay? Sounds awful, okay? If you've ever ridden on a horse, uh, especially if you're not used to it, it's like not a super comfortable experience. 
uh, and there's a lot of like kind of bouncing up and down. Now imagine doing that for like days and you're pregnant. Sounds terrible, right? Okay, so they get to Bethlehem. They're in their destination. All of the hotels are full. Joseph forgot to book an Airbnb for his pregnant teen wife, okay? What the heck, Joseph? Uh, he didn't get on Hotel.com, and now Mary isn't just super pregnant or tired or uncomfortable. Now she also has nowhere to sleep, okay? And then, just because there wasn't enough going wrong already, Mary goes into labor, probably all the bouncing around on the donkey that she'd been doing that day, as in, like, the baby's coming, okay? Now, far away from their home, no bed to sleep in or to have a baby in, okay? If you're Mary, you're super overwhelmed at this point. Now, I know things were different 2,000 years ago, and I know that there was a different culture for that time and place, but I can promise you this. Doesn't matter what culture you're in or what time you're in, this situation is less than ideal. It actually stinks, right? Because Joseph's desperation to find a place led them to a barn for Mary to have this baby in, and it smells like animals and their stuff, okay? That's not a good smell. <laughs> That's where they end up, and that's where Mary has her first child, away from her family, away from her home, and definitely away from anything comfortable. She had her baby, and just her Joseph, and she was completely alone, and no one expected it. So in fact, if you're Mary or Joseph, instead of like joyful or happy, I'm much more likely to think that God is distant, or God is mad at us, he's forgotten us. God is punishing us, he's abandoned us, or God is silent. Because if God doesn't do what we think he should, if God doesn't behave like we expect him to, then it makes sense to assume we've done something wrong or that God is just not what we thought he was. In fact, chances are there were a lot of people who already thought those things about God long before he sent his son to be born in a barn, because for hundreds of years he had been silent. There were no prophets with messages from God to hear. There was no sign of being freed from the Roman Empire that ruled them. There was no indication that God even cared about them anymore, let alone that he was doing anything about it. By all appearances, considering expectations and considering reality, God was nowhere to be found. The God that they expected wasn't there because they thought that God was powerful, like a military leader taking the land back, or that God was obvious. He was showing up in a, a palace or a wealthy family, right? That's what they expected of the Messiah. They thought God was predictable and doing what the people wanted if they followed the rules. They thought that God was exactly like they expected him to be, arriving like they thought that he would with the messages that they wanted to hear. But for all the expectations they had of God, it turns out they missed the one that mattered most. It wasn't that God had let them down, not at all, which would have made him undependable or weak or not worth following. It was that they missed who he really was and expected something completely different than who God had always been. And who was this God? What was this God like? Well, an angel had showed up to tell Joseph exactly what God was like, exactly what God was going to be like when he arrived. The angel says this in Matthew 1, 21 through 23. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So these people are expecting a warrior, a ruler, a punisher of enemies, a king, someone to take charge, and they were disappointed. There's nothing more opposite than a warrior, king, ruler, than a baby born in a barn and laid in a manger. Their expectations did not meet reality. And the truth is they got something far better. They got a God who was with them, not in a palace, but in a barn, meaning he wasn't an out of reach ruler. He was an accessible and reachable God for every single human being. 
not just the ones that had enough money or enough power. God with them was the idea that they just did not see coming and they didn't expect. But it was an idea that changed everything. God with us means that no matter what, we are never alone. No matter our behavior, no matter our good days or our bad days, no matter our family situation or our financial status, no matter what we've done that we are proud of or embarrassed of. So what I want you to remember is this, no matter what, God is with us. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it started with Christmas, but it continues to be true because of Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, and his leaving the Holy Spirit with us forever. In other words, the Spirit of God lives in us as a reminder that we are never alone. It was like for the first time, the lights came on. Jesus is the light of the world, the light that helps us to see God differently, to see ourselves differently, and to see everything else differently. And that's a light that is with us and that we can use in every single area of our lives. So when you think of God with us, it changes everything. It means no matter your reality, God is with you in it. Your family may seem super dysfunctional, but God is with you. Your dating life isn't what you want it to be, but God is with you. You're failing geometry. God is with you. You didn't get the part you wanted in the play. God is with you. You're scared about what's happening in the world. Same. I think we all are, but God is with us. In other words, we are just not in this alone. We aren't left to figure out life and scary stuff and annoying stuff and the stuff that we worry about. We have a God that is with us. Jesus changed the way that we see God. He gave us a new way to understand him and relate to him. He's not distant. He's not far off. He's not an angry or a God that comes down on us with, with angry fists and he's not a punisher. He's very merciful. He's gentle with us. He's accessible. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says this about himself. I'm the light of the world. Light helps you see what you didn't see before, which is exactly what Jesus did for us with God. The light helps us know what to expect from God and who he is, and that is good news. You might be asking, so what? God is with me. What can I do with that? Like, what am I supposed to, how am I supposed to, like, react to that information? Well, for you, it might just mean one thing. Find one way this week to keep reminding yourself that God is with you. Maybe it's writing a note in your phone or asking a small group leader or a trusted friend or adult to help remind you. Or maybe you've known that God is with you. Try reminding someone else this week. Here's the thing, when you know that God is with you, and you know that he's promised to never leave, it's far more difficult to be disappointed in God. Because that's a promise that he will never break. Christmas is the best time to take a second look at the way that we see God ourselves and the people around us, and to let Jesus shine a light on an amazing promise. The God of the universe came down to earth to show you that he loves you and to show you that he cares about you and to show you that he's with you. Yeah, God's going to do things that we don't expect and they're going to look different maybe than we thought that they would, you know? But that doesn't mean that he's not good and that doesn't mean that he's not with us. Maybe it just means that we don't know God like we thought that we did. Maybe it means that there's some aspect of his character or of his personality that we just haven't discovered yet. Our expectations are often a little wrong and that's okay, we're human. But it also means that we should be surrendering our expectations and know that God is good and trust that he is who he says he is. I'm gonna pray for us. Jesus, Number one, thank you for Christmas. Um, God, I thank you for the hope that, that it reminds us of. God, we can use some hope right now in this crazy situation in the world. God, I just ask and pray that you, um, God, that you would 
just help us to understand who you are. Teach us what your personality is like, what your character is like. And God, whenever we're surprised by something that you do or you, you choose something unexpected, God, that you would shower us with uh, love and mercy and grace and give us understanding. Uh, God, that we may know you more and even deeper than we ever thought possible. Jesus, we love you. Amen. All right. I will see you guys soon. <laughs> Hopefully next week I'll be there. I'll be out of my quarantine by then. So stay safe, stay healthy. I hope you guys had a fantastic Thanksgiving.